الحمد لله الذي لم يتخذ ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الملك ولم يكن له ولي من الذل وكبره تكبيرا والحمد لله الذي انزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا والحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبد الله ورسوله ارسله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا فصلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وان شر الامور محدثاتها وان كل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد ان اقول اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وقضى ربك الا تعبدوا الا اياه وبالوالدين احسانا اما يبلغن عندك الكبر احدهما او كلاهما فلا تقل لهما اف ولا تنهرهما وقل لهما قولا كريما واخفض لهما جناح الذل من الرحمه وقل رب ارحمهما كما ربياني صغيرا رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي فاللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا اله الا الله واللهم اجعلنا من الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر امين يا رب العالمين First and foremost I'd like to remind myself and all of you that the month of Ramadan is around the corner and I pray that even though we are in a unique circumstance this year that we make the most of this month and that we don't find ourselves wasting away time that could be used in the worship of Allah Uh, this is a time that maybe it's a, a strange blessing for some of us too, that as difficult as the circumstances, that we find ourselves having a lot of time to ourselves and not busy with other things. Uh, and that might be creating all kinds of other trials for us, but in one sense, it may be a really good opportunity for us to get closer to Allah and to spend more time with His book and contemplating it in prayer. So I pray that all of us make the most of this month and mend ourselves in whatever we need to uh, in this time of reflection. Anyway, I want to continue with the khutbah that I started last week. I was telling you the equivalent of the Ten Commandments in the previous scripture is given to us in Surah Al-Isra, Surah number 17, also called Surah Bani Israel, the Surah of the Israelites, the children of Israel. And this is from 23 to 40. And I started off talking about the first part of ayah number 23, where Allah has decreed that you should worship none except Him. We just talked about that part. Allah ta'abudu illa iyahu. What's remarkable about that ayah is that Allah... could have separated that ayah and then, because that's the opening statement, and then you have all these other commandments that go separately. But what he did is he took the first of those commandments after worshiping him and he put it inside of the same ayah. He put it within the same ayah. Now this is important, because when Allah decides that something should be within the ayah, that means that those ideas cannot be separated from each other, they're two sides of the same coin. Right, so what Allah is going to tell us in this ayah is actually an extension of worshipping Himself. Even though all the other acts of obedience are also acts of worship to Allah. This one stands in a unique place because it's been placed right after the mention of Allah and within the same ayah, and inside of the same ayah. And so what is that commandment? He says, وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا An easy translation would be, and when it comes to both parents, the best. The excellence, when it comes to both parents, excellence. There's a few things to talk about here. Um, first and foremost, I don't believe in any other scripture or any other religious tradition, there is the kind of emphasis on the rights of parents and the goodness we have to, and I, I wouldn't even say rights, the goodness we have to give to our parents. Uh, rights means that you owe them something, right? Ihsan means you're going out of your way to do your very, very best towards someone. And... 
When Allah talks about people that are needy, He says they have haqqun ma'loom. They have a right. Right? And the Prophet ﷺ will tell us that our body has rights over us. And the spouse has rights over you. Right? Your deen has rights over you. Of course, you. but the language of the Qur'an goes far above rights. It uses the word ihsan, which is the very, very best that we can do. And he didn't say, do your best to both parents. The language here does not mention a verb. It's as if, if I were to try to translate, when it comes That's what he says. It's not as if there's a kind of emphasis on this one concept, like it's on virtually no other concept in, in the Qur'an's commandments. First of all, let's understand why that is, then understand that commandment better. It's a loaded commandment, it's not a simple thing. But before we do, we need to understand why is it so important. Allah Azza wa has described multiple times in the Qur'an that He's our Creator, but after us being, us being created, it's the mother that had to carry the child burden after burden. And she had to physically bear the pains of carrying her son or daughter. And giving part of herself up, giving part of her comforts up, taking injuries on, and almost dying while giving you and me birth. So our mothers experience the kind of bleeding, the kind of pain, their body starts splitting open so that we can come out of them. That's what they went through so we could be born. And we have who's going to clean us, how are we going to stay safe? We have the universe was the belly of our mother, and she was going through all of those pains. She was the one who couldn't sleep at night. She was the one who was throwing up. She was the one who when she tasted food, it tasted like paper. She was the one that had all that entire time. They, and only increased. And as it increased, then her love more and more pain did not decrease, it actually increased. She's more as the days go by than less. It's, it's ironic that the same child is becoming a heavier burden on her body. It's pulling on her spine. It's causing her all kinds of pain. And she's falling more in love with it. She's, she walks by a table corner and it's sharp. Is literally killing her every single day. And this is something that the mother does with for no expectations of return. There's, the mother doesn't want anything back. That's all she wants, is for her baby to be safe. When she's praying, she's praying for this child. When she's, when she's worried, she's worried for this child. Even if she doesn't want to eat, she'll say, no, I need to eat because the baby will get the food. Then comes time to give the birth. And when she gives that birth, then on the one hand you've got you know people that are ab- mothers that are able to do a natural delivery which is painful enough as it is right, and difficult enough as it is but even during that the pains can be so intense nowadays people take epidurals right and a lot of times the epidural goes in the wrong part of the spine and they're not able to find it and they're getting injected multiple times and now they've got back pains for life because they gave birth right and every time they get they they, they hurt in that place even years later, is a reminder of the birth. Right? That's, and they, they, no regrets. If they had to do that all over again, they'd give birth to their child all over again. They take that pain. That's what a mother does. It's remarkable also that in the Quran, Allah's most profound, one of His most profound names, Ar-Rahman, in a hadith Qudsi, Allah describes that He named the mother's womb by His own name, Ar-Rahman. Because the, the mother's womb is called Rahm. So there's a reason we have to appreciate first and foremost our mothers because they were doing stuff for us before we even came out of her in this world. When we were at a cellular, we were a cellular organism. <laughs> we were nothing more than just a pound of, or not even a pound, just some ounces of flesh. At that point, our mother was in service to us, taking care of us. And this is similar in a very limited sense to what Allah is doing for us constantly. Constantly providing for us, constantly caring for us, constantly protecting us, and we're not doing anything for Him in return. We can't. We can't. We're not even, most of us that are being taken care of by Allah, and yet, this is why there's a connection drawn. If you want to appreciate Allah in the unseen, who's done so 
point should be your own mother. That's not even in the unseen. You could see what she did for you. The, the logical connection between these two things is, if a person cannot find in themselves the urge to do their very mother, then how are they going to do their very best towards Allah? How are they going to do? Because the mother did that for them. So how are they not going to be able to? If they can't even, you know, thank Allah's creation, how are they going to get to thank Allah? This is kind of extra. And hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, "Man lam yashkur nas lam yashkur Allah." Someone who's not grateful to people can't be grateful to Allah, right? And the first person who's done this is why perhaps the, the famous hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, where a person comes to him and says, "Who should I? Who do I need to be the best to?" And he says, "Ummuka, ummuka, ummuka." Three times he kept asking, "Who else? Who else?" And he kept saying, "Your mother, your mother, your mother," and eventually came to your father, right? So there is a special emphasis played, paid on the mother. In the Qur'an also, Allah will say, be the best to both parents, and then he immediately he'll start talking about the mother in several occasions, and the pregnancy especially. Now why does Allah talk about the pregnancy? This is important too. Because you and I don't remember it. We can only be told about it. The things your dad does for you, the dad maybe provide, pays the bills maybe, the dad paid for your college tuition. Maybe the dad bought you clothes. Maybe the dad nurtured you. Maybe the dad protected you. Maybe the dad did these other things, right? Those you can remember. But the, the main where she gave part of herself up, you and I can't even remember that. We, we won't remember those days. So Allah goes out of His way to remind us of what the mother does. And that doesn't mean we don't remember what the father does, but it's as if Allah wants us to recall ourselves. What did your father do? How did, what did he do for you? Now, so this is, this is kind of, as I move forward, I know that, uh, and I wanted to give this khutbah and, and you know, uh, on, make it live on social media particularly also because all the principle and the, the commandment in our religion, but life isn't that simple. Life is not that simple for everybody. So not everybody had parents, for example. Or you have people in the world whose parents abandoned them. Or you have pa parents that have abused their children. You have parents that have beat their children, tortured their children. That's happened. That's a reality. You have people that have psychologically tormented their children. You have parents that have tried to do their best in their own mind, but actually they didn't do a good job at all. Right? So you've got when it comes to parents. Well, dear parents, the problem becomes when we're talking about the word of Allah, and a person, as soon as they hear the word of Allah, they're thinking of how it does not apply to them. The thing to do first is first all the circumstances and how it applies. I tell you from my what situation a human being finds themselves in, there is no exception to these in which they apply applies differently. And just to get, give you just some comfort when it comes to that, you have to be able to tell Allah on just my very best. I did my very best. For some people, their very best may be to stay away from an abusive parent. And they should be able to tell because that when they're close to their parents, their parents became so abusive that it made them sick. And they had to literally stay away for their own mental health and sometimes their physical health, for their physical well-being. That doesn't mean they get to hate their parents or not do their best. They, can, they now have to work with doing the best they can from a distance. They sometimes for financial situation, financial reasons, a family is not doing well and one of their children has to travel to a different country or a different city or a different place where they have to go get a job. And they have to provide, they have to provide for their parents too. And they're doing that on mother's feet. Not you know, give her a glass of water because I'm all the way here working. But you know what? Life in, this is the that you can't do more than that. So you don't have to live with guilt. Allah, Allah created different circumstances for different people. So even later, let's just forget. The word of Allah is in the highest place. When 
ourselves, no matter what situation we find ourselves in. And no Allah does. The issue though is, am I able to answer Allah and say, I am doing the very best I can? And that's a, that's a, there can be an arrogant answer to that for you and me, and say, yeah, I'm actually doing my best. Am I so confident that Allah will interrogate me and I'll say, yep, no, there's no way I could have done any better. There's nothing I could have done more. That's a that I have to ask myself. And I'm getting ahead of myself, but actually, two I my nose. And he does in circumstances. He says, after talking about the parents, which I have knows better what goes on inside yourselves. In takunu salihin, if in fact you are good, he knows, he knows what your situation is. He knows. Then he says, "Wa inna hu kana lil awabina ghafura." And for those who keep coming back, on forgiving, he's always forgiving towards them. So he, at the end of this command, and but you, and if you are. Know that too, and if you keep you keep checking yourself and identifying your faults. And by the way, if you and I fail to find any fault in what we're doing, that's also a really big problem, <laughs> because we weren't created without fault, right? And the before fault out, you are doing better because there's always something you and I could be doing better. There's all there's no escape from that, and the moment we become self Move on to some other part of the Quran because then you know what? For that to and Fusakum, who are Adamu Bivanitaka. Don't declare yourselves so righteous, so pure. He knows better who has taqwa and who doesn't. You don't get that gauge, he does. You don't get that measure, he does. So now let's let's go back into these ayat. He says, Be and when it comes to both Imma Yabluhana in the Kalkibar. Even if they reach old age around you. And especially when they reach old age around you. Whether they reach that old age, Yablu Ghanna Indak al Kibar suggests that it gets extremely difficult to deal with parents as they get older and older and older. In fact, in many ways, the roles reverse. Quran says in Surah Yasin, Mamanu Ammir Hunu Nakisu Fil Khalti, Afalaya Kilun. Whoever we give old age to, we start reversing them in creation. We start re- rewinding them, De- you know, taking away from them. What does that mean? That means when a child is young and they don't get their way, they become stubborn, they have a temper tantrum, they don't want to listen to any reason, they want to throw a fit, they, want to, they, they become unreasonable and, you know, aggressive, unnecessarily aggressive, they have crazy mood swings. And for some people listening to this, they're like, that sounds like my mom right now. That sounds like my dad right now. When they get to a certain age, then they become easily agitated. They can say things and not realize that they're saying something bad. They may not take anything back. You know, ch- children can get so angry and say, I hate you. You never do anything for me. They can say that. Kids' brains aren't fully developed, so when they get emotionally worked up, they can say crazy things. You know, and guess what happens when parents get older? They'll say some crazy things. All kinds of stuff will come out of their mouth. And it, you'll take it to heart. Step back and say, their brain hasn't fully formed yet. And they have and I need to help them get through this so they get better control over their emotions and deal with a child differently. Right? And you you develop a kind of patience to deal with them. The same way Allah particularly mentions as parents get older, that you might have extra difficulty dealing with them. And or it may not be about their temper, it may be about their health. Maybe they need constant care. Maybe it's not even about their temper, maybe it's just their commentary. Maybe they're constantly throwing a comment that insults you or jabs you, and they just get a kick out of it, you know? Maybe they're always comparing you to a sibling. Maybe they're always, like, they're, they're doing something hurtful and they know it, but they just, they're used to doing it, and they just want to see a reaction out of you, and the moment you give a reaction, they say, this is what Islam teaches you. Huh, this is your Islam. Why do you even pray? Why do you even wear a hijab? Why do you even have a beard if you're going to talk to your parents like this? So they'll set you, set you a good old trap, and then when you fall in, they're like, ha! And that can, that, that can happen. Parents can get in that habit. It's possible. 
And they, maybe they're in that habit and they don't even realize they're doing it. That can happen too. So people find when it comes to parents. And especially, you know, the reality is if you, if you look around at different situations of people and, you know, people write comments on social media, other places about their stories with their parents. And a lot of times, you know, we don't understand the Islamic tradition and what the rights of parents actually are. We just understand you have to be your very best. And people assume that this means they have absolute rights. Right? Which isn't the case in Islam. That's actually not the case in Islam. But do we have rights? And do we have to do our very best to them? Yes. So let's I'm look at how this was applied historically. And what our tradition says about it. What the sacred tradition says about it. But let's, so, so let's move along before I wrap this khutbah up for today. And Don't ever say uff to them. Now uff in Arabic is the expression of I've had enough. So let me translate uff in American English. Or 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 anything else like that. Any other gesture that way. Everything's okay? So, that kind, where you express frustration. Or, or, you don't say anything, you just do this. <sighs> That's what's not allowed. Let me give you another translation of uff. Your parents tell you something, or you're having a conversation with them, and you go, you just give them that look. Or you roll your eyes like, all of that's oof. He says, when they come to you in old age, one or two of them, one or both, then فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفٍ Don't give them attitude. Don't give your parents attitude. That's not your mom saying it. That's not your dad saying it. That's Allah saying it. And He's saying it in the same ayah that He said, You shall worship none but Me. And the first act of worship to none but Me, this is you humbling yourself to Allah, that your face is not going to give an attitude, your eyes are not going to give an attitude, your mouth is not going to give an attitude, your exhale is not going to give an attitude, you walking away storming and slamming a door is not going to give, you're not going to give that attitude to your parents because you are a slave of Allah. It has nothing to do with your parents. You're a slave of Allah, that I'm a slave of Allah. That's it. And we forget that because we're dealing with a person, and that person might get under our skin, that person, that person might feel like they're being unfair, and we forget, or we start thinking we're just dealing with a person, you're not dealing with a person, you're actually dealing with Allah, and Allah told you how to deal with them. So you will not make passive-aggressive comments to them. You're not going to make sarcastic remarks to them. You're not in your head, not from your face, not from your words. You will not do it. But, I know, I know, I know. فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُ وَأُفِنْ And the, the Use someone with, the, with a verb قَوْل But it's also used when you talk about someone. Don't even go to your... Nope, that's, that's gone. We can't. And if we, you and I have done it, and we have done it, then take a step back. Because Allah has, worship, Allah has decreed that we worship none except our master. And then he, he drew this line. That's, that's his book. That's why I, I mentioned earlier, وَكَلِمَةُ اللَّهِ هِيَ الْعُلِيَةِ The word of Allah is in the highest place. فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمْ أَوْفٍ وَلَا تَنْهَرْهُمَا And don't scold them. Don't yell at them. Don't talk back to them. Don't become aggressive with them. And yes, I already mentioned there are cases of abuse. Yes, there are, I already mentioned there are cases of abandonment, abandonment. There's even cases of criminal behavior. There's all of that. But first we understand what Allah says, then we understand how it applies to those crazy situations. We have to first balance. Well, scold them. Don't yell at them. Don't become aggressive with them. وَقُلْ لَهُمَا قَوْلًا كَرِيمًا And speak to both of them in dignified, noble fashion. Don't talk to them like you talk to your friends. 
You have to be generous in your speech with your parents. You have to be noble in your... This is karam. This karam in Arabic is generosity. And karam in, in Arabic is honor and dignity. Meaning respectful tone, respectful words when you speak to your parents. So for example, if I call one of my children and they say... What? That... What? Saba? Yes, dad? There needs to be a change of tone. This is speaking respectfully. When somebody's talking to you and you're not even looking at them and talking to them, that's not respect, is it? He says, speak to them in respectful fashion. When you call them or talk to them and you use words for them, sometimes people use words for them that are like their name. Like some, pe some kids calling their parents by their name. Hey, Naman, what you have for lunch? Excuse me? مَقُولَّهُمَا قَوْلًا karima. Speak to them in respectful tone. And that's not respectful. Now it can be that in different cultures, different things are considered respectful or not respectful, but some things are universal. And things like our facial expressions, the language we use, the tone we use, the words we choose to use, how we choose to respond. If, if, I, if, I told, if my, my father told me to do something, that I should go get medicine or go get whatever, and I say, okay, okay. That's not a respectful response. Yes. As soon as I can. Or I'll get it at this time. Would that be okay? Like you have to go out of your way to treat parents in language with royalty. With a kind of royalty. And this is, this is not an easy thing to do. I can, I can tell you, we, we live in a time where, because of the, you know, this is the last thing I'll say because it's over my time in khutbah, we are, we are post-industrial revolution. We, we live in a new economy that the world never faced before. In the old economies of the world, people had time to spend with their kids. So they developed kinds of re relationships and they were part of their nurturing. And parents would spend time with them, teach them manners, eat with them, sleep with them. They, they would do these things. But now, on their tablet, we're in a new world. Human beings don't interact with each other the way they used to. They don't nurture each other the way they used to. Then we don't develop deep relationships the way they used to. They don't, we don't have environment. Our kids never learned what it means to be respectful. In fact, because a lot of the parents, they saw exactly the same kind of behavior they have towards their parents, and now their children are doing it to them. Because they've seen no different. So we were in the modern economy too. We didn't have to be we're expecting more than we're giving out. So if, our, if you find, when you hear this khutbah that your children aren't respectful, they're not respectful, then it's a two-way street. Then maybe there needs to, we need to start with, you know, not just, you know, taking this ayah and slapping them across the face and saying, look at what Allah says. Every human being needs to look at themselves. The parent needs to look at themselves. The child and well, that's why I had an attitude. If you really think that that of Allah, good luck. You know that we don't have an excuse, but the parents also have to have rahma for their children. So when their children are misbehaving, then they have to lovingly show them how to come back to a you know a a, a healthy place. Why? Because it's not because parents need respect. Because if you're believing parents, then you know that Allah put respect for parents right next to worshipping Him. Right? And if your children aren't doing that, they're not just in trouble with you. If your children aren't doing that, they're in big trouble with Allah. And you love your kids too much to stand by as they are digging their hole deep in front of Allah. We don't want, we don't want any of our kids to be in trouble with their master. So if they can't be, if, if yelling and scolding and disciplining is not the way to go, then maybe a loving way to bring them back into the fold. Maybe a res do what save your kids from being disrespectful to you. To, to be, because something is making them disrespectful. And there's a lot, I, inshallah, I will spend some time on, and some, some people are wondering, you know, because it's Ramadan time, khutbah should be about Ramadan is coming, let's get into gear, etc. You're going to get plenty of that on the internet anyway, so I'm okay with that. Uh, what, what I am, and I'm going to be doing a lot of Qur'an broadcasts through the month of Ramadan, but the khutbah series, I'll stay with these commandments, inshallah ta'ala, and try to cover as much of this as we can, because I think we all need it. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim, wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim.
الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد عباد الله رحمكم الله اتقوا الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون أقم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين كتابا موقوتا أستنهت لبعض